Well, for the first session proper, it's my privilege to introduce to you from South Africa, Port Elizabeth, Sean Flecknot. A voice, a voice that has come to be respected as a very clear prophetic voice, and we receive Sean as a servant of the Lord who comes to serve us from the office of prophet. So would you put your hands together and receive Sean Blicknot. Well, uh, good morning. It's good to be here this morning. I want to go straight into what I believe God wants me to say to you. For the past three months, um, the Lord led me to begin to study the book of Philippians. And uh, in these three months, I had to specifically delve into, uh, you know, the whole concept of the mind of Christ that is related to us out of the book of Philippians. And for the past three, I think two months I've been teaching in it in our congregation. Not yet done. But today I would like to relate to you some aspects prophetically from the book of, of, of Philippians. And uh, much of what I'm going to do, is the, the whole discourse will be the prophecy that I believe God has got for us uh, in this nation and in the nations of the earth. Most probably, maybe later on, I would have a specific word for Cape Town and then also declare a word specifically for South Africa. Uh, but there's also some general word that God has got for the global arena. So I would like to, for us to just to listen to these things. Now, the global church currently uh, is existing in a context that the church has never existed in before. There is fear, there is perplexity, and destabilization in the nations. And there's a revelation of fractures that is beginning to showcase itself in the political, economic, social spheres of society. And in the midst of all of this, God is expecting a church to embrace an apostolic mindset within the unfolding crisis that is coming upon the earth. Now, many times people think that prop prophetic voices are only releasing to us maybe that which seems to be negative. But it's very important to understand the context within, within which apostolic churches is supposed to function in the days to come. The earth is not going to get better. The issues surrounding the nations is not going to get better. But there will be due movements in the earth as we are approaching the end of time or the time of the end. Dual movements in that, like Isaiah was declaring, see darkness and thick darkness is upon the earth, but upon you my light is, is rising. So rise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. In other words, there will be this dual movement within the earth of light versus darkness. And we are going to see these movements increase in crisis moments that will visit different regions of the earth. I believe that that the prophetic intent of God is very clear for our nation, this nation called South Africa, that there is a, a time frame that God has placed upon this particular nation, and the Lord is going to, in the days to come, begin to deal harshly with those that are standing, especially in the political arena, against what God wants to do. Some of these men are even going to die, because God is not going to allow any political leader to hijack what he wants to do spiritually in this nation. And so, we have entered into these times of great perplexity. Uh, and perplexity and tumult, inward tumult, is causing many to abort the prophetic purpose of the Lord. The intent of the enemy is that we abort the purpose of the Lord. As there is this whole thing happening within the nations, 
And I'm going to later on declare to you what these prophetic impressions are. As these things are beginning to showcase them in the earth, that there needs to be in the midst of all of this a victorious church. There needs to be a church that stands triumphantly, that will become partnership people with the Lord in terms of cooperating with a prophetic purpose. Not a church that will hyperventilate at what we are seeing on the horizon of human life. But a church that understand that we are, have already entered into the victory of Christ, that the battle is already won, but that we are going to go through this with the Lord. So if you look at uh, the stone that was cut out from the mountain, the stone of the kingdom and the stone of Christ, that that stone hit the statue and it caused the statue to be broken. But God was always placing the church in the midst of Babylon. And so Babylon is going to become a very important facet that needs to be studied. We will have to understand the dynamics concerning the Daniel people or the Daniel church. There are certain individuals that need to be studied right now. Daniel, Noah, Moses, Ezekiel, Elijah. We have, we have had studies on Elijah. But we will have to look at these individuals because, and even Job, because we know that these men knew how to stand alone against the, the grain of what society was throwing at it in a day of crisis. There's, for instance, in the day of Noah, the Bible says that the inclination of the hearts of men were continually given to commit evil. And in the midst of evil, the word evil there does not reflect just a wholesale departure from the Lord in terms of uh, gross um, uh, 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 things that are happening within society, but it's a people that has once knew the Lord, but has gone off track and has gone one minute dimension out of alignment from the righteousness of Christ. So in this season, it is not just good enough for us to have some truth, but to have truth that is exact. We got to build exactly in the season. So, but the Bible says, but Noah... Noah found favor in the sight of the Lord. Why? Because he was a man that was righteous, blameless, he feared God, and he walked with God. These are fundamental issues that the church must come into, a church that walked in the arena of great exception, exception to the rule of what contradicts the holy nature of God. So there needs to be a church in the earth that must know how to navigate in the lonely arena of standing against the stream of transactions that will come against it from the arena of that which is filth and corrupt. And so there is a church being built by God, and I don't think that this church has really arisen in the earth yet, in its full scale as yet. Because the, the church currently is still based on an entertainment a mindset and a bless me mentality. So there's there great building going on, but when the storm comes, the storm is going to reveal what is the true church and what is the false church. We can no longer build on the principle of a bless me mentality. We got to come into building correctly, and we need to be related to apostolic sources that are the builders of God in the season. So we can no longer be having church and we are disconnected from apostolic ministry. The first ministry that Jesus identified in building his church is the apostolic. When he said, I am building my church, you cannot build without an apostolic source. Building and the apostolic goes together. So when he said, I'm building my church, he, <clears throat> he was actually saying, the first anointing I will bring into building my church is the anointing of the apostolic. It's not so much about a man that is called an apostle, but has got to do with an apostolic dimension that God wants to build into the lives and the hearts of God's people. I know that God is using apostolic 
figures in the earth, and we are going to look at one of them in the book of Ephesians, sorry, in the book of Philippians in, the, in, 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 in terms of Paul. There are apostolic fathers here. And it's vital that God is now going to showcase what is true apostolic and what is false apostolic streams. Because I want to show you a little bit later on what dimensions apostolically needs to be built in the earth that will, that will regulate in our mindset what true apostolic function is all about. Now, in the midst of all this, the church must embrace apostolic patterns. Listen to the words, apostolic patterns and apostolic example. Paul said, follow my example, or he said, imitate me as I am imitating Christ. In other words, the whole principle of biblical imitation is going to become a reality in the days to come. Not emulation, but imitation. Emulation is the work of the flesh. It is you connecting yourself to a relevant apostolic voice. you drawing from apostolic uh, principles and the doctrine, but, and you teach it as your own, but you never give to that apostolic source uh, the relevant uh, 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 clarity unto that person in terms of honoring that apostolic source. So you are emulating, you are copycatting what God is doing, if you can say it like that. You are a copycat, you're building things, you come to conferences like this, you gather all the information, and you begin to build it into your church, but you are not connected to an apostolic fathering source. Now, I want to declare this to you today, that that season is over. That God is going to bring forth, uh, he's, gonna, he's going to open up everything that is concealed. I don't want to run ahead of myself. All of what I'm saying is prophetic. So I want you to pick up the things that I'm saying to you today. That we are no longer going, going to build on emulation, but on imitation. Imitation flows by a heart connection with an apostolic fathering source. Recognizing the corporality of the brotherhood. Coming together in corporate streams, connecting to a fathering source, and brothers coming to together, joining their hearts in commitment in a church without walls. God wants a church without walls. Soon, we are going to no longer talk about one another in terms of our title, but we are going to just be brothers, functioning in a particular office. Like Paul talked to you about today, how do we operate as being a doulos for God? Even though we, op we have heard in the past that we are sons of God by position, that we are the social continuance of our Father, our Heavenly Father in the earth, by not emulating Him, but by imitating Him through apostolic mediums that God has given into our lives. But now God is lifting our our functionality into that of a bond servant. What is a bond servant is what we, are, what we need to prosecute here today. What is a bond servant? And so I want us to look at the life of Paul. Can we have the book of Philippians chapter 2? Philippians chapter 2. So with this in mind, I want to use the letter of Paul to the Philippians. Now Paul... He's in prison. In fact, he's under house arrest. He's incarcerated. And Paul, if you, if you want to understand the context, the historical, scriptural context of the book of Philippians, you've got to go study Acts chapter 16. We haven't got time to go into Acts chapter 16. Go and study Acts chapter 16. Paul wanted to go onto the soil of Asia. But the Holy Spirit prevented Paul from going to Asia. And Paul then had a vision of the man from Macedonia that was calling Paul to come and help them build. And so from there, Paul then changed direction to Europe. And so Paul is going to Europe. And there is going to establish this church of Philippi. Now the Philippian church... Uh, 
today in modern, in modern Europe would be somewhere in the north of Greece, whereas Corinth would be in the southern regions of Greece, and you have the church at Ephesus somewhere in Turkey, right? So you have this triangle when you look at it. You have the Philippian church, the Corinthian church, and you have the Ephesian church, and you have this triangle of ministry for the apostle. Paul now is establishing historically, is he's going for the first time on the soil of Europe, and he's, going to, and he's going to found the first apostolic church in Europe. And Paul is going there, and because in Philippi used to be a, a Greek um, city, but now it is part of the Macedonian province, which the Romans have conquered. And so now you have a lot of slaves that has been created by Rome in the Philippian uh, uh, city because now the people are under Roman bondage. And what the emperor used to also do, Octavian at that time, what he did was to impose upon the, the Greek generals that they just conquered, they sent them all into Philippi and gave them land. And so causing them to remain faithful to the throne of Rome and to the emperor. And so we have in the Philippian colony, it's a colony of Rome that is thousands of mile, miles away. But when you look at the Philippian colony, you will see that in that colony, you have both Greeks and you have both Roman soldiers that, are, that have been given the opportunity to live in that area. And so what is happening in that particular area Paul now, for the first time, goes to, to Philippi, and the first convert that Paul made in the Philippian uh, uh, church or on the continent of Europe was Lydia, a woman. Because in Philippi, there were only a few Jews there. I need to go quickly through this history. There were only a few Jews there. And uh, they say historically that in order for you to, to have, according to rabbinical law, if you wanted to have and establish a Jewish synagogue, that you had to be 10 and more humans to start something like that. But because there were few Jews in Philippi, it was the custom of the, of the, the woman to go to the river, and there Paul met Lydia, and there he, she became the first convert on the soil of Europe. Later on, Paul met a slave girl that was a false prophetic dimension of Babylon that was following the apostles around and causing great consternation while they were following them around. And Paul rebuked that demon out of the slave girl and then brought deliverance to this girl. And I believe that that was the second convert to, to, to become part of the household of faith in the Philippian church. Later on, we know because of Paul and Silas doing this, they were now incarcerated in the prison because they were breaking the code of Rome by, by doing this to the slave girl. But more than that, they were causing the economic prosperity of the owners of the slave girl to diminish. And so they went to the authorities and then they were put into a, Rome, a Roman jail. But in one night, God broke them out while the apostles were singing, exuding songs, and God break them out by a great uh, earthquake. And in that, the Roman soldier, the, um, the guy over 100, the centurion, he wanted to commit suicide, but Paul said to him, don't do it, and led him and his household to the faith in Christ Jesus. And this is how this church started. But in the midst of all of this, Philippi was also enriched with a lot of gold deposits. There were... There was a highway that was traveled, well-traveled, through Philippi. And so this was a place where everybody would love to be, where everybody wanted to be established. The, they say, according to history, that the normal language that they would speak was Latin, but that the business language of the day was Greek, because that was the language that they could really uh, uh, transact with. But you have this enclave a stronghold of Rome built in the province of Macedonia, 
called the Philippian city. In that city now, you have a lot of people, because that was a colony of Rome, that is subscribing to emperor worship. The emperors, or the Caesars, as they were known, were deified, and they were called Lord and Savior. And so there was a conflict of interest that began to happen in Philippi, simply because the true believers, they were the ones that professed Jesus as Lord, and these guys were professing Caesar as Lord. So there was this tug of war going on, and Paul is incarcerated, sitting in the depth of his, of his prison cell, and he's writing this, this book. He is in Rome, writing to the Philippians. And so the Philippians sent a guy called Epaphroditus to Paul with a gift uh, which Paul calls uh, a, a, a sever in, the, in, the, in his nostrils. And so Epaphroditus is with Paul, and according to the history, it says that this guy would book himself into the prison to be with Paul and attended to Paul while he was incarcerated. Paul went for the first time there with Silas, with Timothy, and with Luke. And so these gentlemen are in this place. Paul is incarcerated in prison. Uh, and uh, so what is happening is that Paul sits in this Roman prison and he's writing a letter to encourage the Philippians that have got liberty. Right through the book, if you, if you, I'm going fast here, right through the book, you will find 17 times uh, the word joy or rejoice is mentioned. While the apostle is sitting in his own peculiar predicament, he is encouraging a people that are thousands of miles away by a letter, and he writes like this. He says, I have you in my heart. He says, I love you with the affections of Christ. And at every remembrance of you, I have you in my prayers. So this man, Paul, simply had a conception, conceptual reality of Christ that was beyond the historical or the theological concept of who Christ was. And he is writing to these people being in stocks and bonds. And there came a time in that time of incarceration where Paul also came to a place of losing sight. You will see right through the book, there Paul mentioned things like this. He says, for to me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. He's not just making that statement to die is gain. The reason why he makes the statement is because he's feeling the pressure of Roman oppression upon his flesh. And so he says, it will be better for me rather if I die, but far more better that I should live, that I will be an encouragement unto you, Philippians. And so Paul has got these people in his heart. Nowhere in the book of Philippians do you find Paul is writing doctrinally to them, but Paul is writing to encourage them, them that are now under tremendous persecution because of emperor worship on the one side, and Paul is now talking to them because it was very important for a Roman to, to, to really build upon the status of his citizenship. That's why Paul would make statements like that. Your citizenship is in heaven from where we are awaiting a savior. And so he's encouraging them. And I want you to see the context before I speak about this. The context, the historical context, why Paul is making certain statements. He's not just making the statements in a vacuum, he's making it out of deep concern for the Philippian believer. Now, what is vital for us today is that like Paul as an apostolic type, writing a letter to people under tremendous pressure, while he himself is under pressure, I believe that we are maneuvering into a season where pressure is going to come upon the earth. The pressure that is going to come is going to reveal who you are and how you have built. That's what Jesus is saying in Matthew chapter 7 when he compares the two builders of the house. He says, let me show you a man that hear these words of mine and put them into practice. 
It's like a man that builds his house on a rock. And when the storms come and beat against the house, that house will not fall. It will remain. But let me show you a man that hear these words of mine and do not put them into practice. Now you see there are two builders here. They are both building. And building is an apostolic dimension. So if you say you are building and not just operating in a bless me entertainment zone of church, but you are really building, but you can build false patterns into the hearts of God's people if you only tell them, hear the truth, but don't live the truth. The Pharisees operated in a false dimension of building. They would say and do not do. And, and, and Jesus said to them, you must do what they say, but don't listen to them. In, in, and, and don't follow them in, in their lifestyle. So in other words, what is a Pharisee position? It's a position where you have incorporated truth within your mentality, but that truth has not found a practical applicability in your lifestyle. In other words, you know truth that you do not live. You are a Pharisee. In this season, God is going to showcase who are the Pharisees in this move. We can no longer just come to places like this and gather information and then gather more information and have showcased the information, but the information never find applicability in a living example upon the face of the earth. So this dimension of the apostolic that God is after is a dimension where there's a manifestation of the doctrine in the sons of God. God wants the doctrine to be manifested now. We can no longer say and do not do. Often say to impress others because of their knowledge of the scriptures. They are self-actualizing. They are self-absorbed. They know too much and they do too little. Better do the 1% that you know and not just you know, the 100% that you know. So it's important and imperative. These are imperatives for us in this, in this season. And so I want us to reflect a little bit about on Paul. So it is very important to extract apostolic wisdom as we journey toward our expected end. Like Jesus said unto his disciples in the book of Philip in, in uh, John chapter 4, from this, this, verse 34 to 36, he says there, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. My food is to do the will, not pray the will, not fast about the will, not ponder about the will, not sitting in whether I should do it or not doing it. It's an executive action. You got to do the will. You can only do it when you live it. The Christ inside of you and me needs now to be reflected out in biblical example. We got to live the lifestyle and no longer talk the talk, but walk the walk. 20 years have gone by in the apostolic. And God said to me, there's a new phase coming. And I want to unfold that phase to you today. It's a phase of reality. It's a phase of using your sonship and declaring your servanthood and your doula status to God. Losing your rights and have your rights vested in another. Losing your rights to, to exist the way that you have predetermined how you will operate in the earth. But now bring your will under the authority of another and bonding your life as it were to that person, losing your rights in the in, in the experience of it and showcasing that your ear is pierced. Remember, in the book of Psalms chapter 40, I think it's from verses 4 to 6 or 6 to 8, it says, there are burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire. And then some of the versions says, but the body prepared. Other version says, but my ears you have pierced. The piercing of the ear 
has got to do with the doulos, how a bond slave operates. Now, I want to list for you a few, a few things what it means to be truly apostolic, very quickly, a few dimensions. I want to remind us about these characteristics of the apostolic dimension. First of all, acquiring a disciplined mentality. And that's what Paul is showcasing for us in the book of Philippians, a disciplined mentality. Number two, an appetite for struggle. Say struggle. An appetite for struggle. And the biggest struggle is against yourself. Come on. It's not against them. It's against me and my orphan mindset. The biggest struggle is the struggle to die, to self. It's the struggle to let go of my ambition. It's the struggle that I want to be something also in this apostolic, but you are not because you haven't got the grace for it. It's the struggle of not wanting to die of your preferred understanding of the move and to submit everything to an apostolic father. So it's that struggle, so we need to develop the struggle, this appetite against suffering, not self-inflicted infirmity, but the struggle because you contradict by your lifestyle the earthly environment in which you find yourself. You are contradicting. You are the excellent example of contradiction against environmental influence. You are not living by the culture of the earth. You are living by the culture of another dimension, the heavenly order. It is from there where you are awaiting a savior. And it's, it is from there where your lowly body will be transformed into his glorious body. There is a holy expectation that something is about to happen, that there needs to be a transformation in our lives. But we need to settle the issue of where my citizenship is. Where is your citizenship? Is it on the earth? Yes, you live in Cape Town. You live where you are within your geographical area, but you are a citizen of heaven. In other words, your perspective needs to change. We need to have a, a changed perspective about where we live from. We are not living out from our geographical location called Cape Town. Even though Cape Town is a geographical place in South Africa, but we need to begin to see beyond the, the, the geographics of Cape Town or Johannesburg or Pretoria, but we got to connect into the geographics of the spirit to understand God's dimension of movement within those areas. Another thing that is imperative is that we must not shift ancient landmarks. Listen, that's a warning. We must not shift ancient landmarks. What does that mean? It means that the landmarks that were given to us through generational transference by fathers begetting sons and sons walking in imitation of their fathers becoming fathers themselves and transmitting it through a line of descent to the next generation. That these landmarks, these are ancient landmarks that the forefathers have committed unto us through covenantal joining of hearts. These landmarks must not be shifted. We are contemporaries at best with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So we are not building anything that is brand new. That is what Jesus is saying in John chapter 4. He says that you are entering into the labors of those that has gone before you. Now you become, as sons, the completion of the cycle of reality. You must complete what the forefathers have started. So you are a continuum from what they have started, continue to build on what they have laid as foundations. So we are building something that is original, something credible, something that comes from the heavenly order. We are reconstructing in the earth. The apostolic is not something new. The apostolic always existed in the heart of God. The authentic, the original, the credible. Our God is credible. Our God is original. Our God is not a fake. So if you study God, you see that he's totally apostolic. In fact, he is the great apostle that sits in session right now 
over the affairs of the universe. People, people talk about the intercessory ministry of Jesus. I talk about the sessionary work of Christ. It is the work of his mediator, mediate, his mediatory function and his high priestly function that we need to begin to look at and understand. Fully man, fully God, standing between the two. He is a man, fully God, fully man. This that we are talking about. So another thing that is apostolic. There must be a vision for the global harvest. Understanding divine order in the house of God. Issues of obedience. Deliberately setting yourself under the one sent into your life and the word that the one brings to you. Operating in the code of honor. We have heard these things before. I'm reminding us this, about this again this morning. Operating the code of honor, not doing your own thing, not running away. Submitting to what God is doing through your life. Even when the pressure hits you, you don't run away out of covenant commitment. If you have made covenants, you stay connected in those covenants. There are many going to run away in these last days. That's going to reconnect somewhere else because the rubber is going to meet the road now. Things are going to hot up in the earth as God is bringing increasing crisis upon the church. The increase of crisis is to bring two fundamental things. A great separation and the internal purification of the hearts and the minds of God's people. God wants a pure church. God wants the church as it existed in the book of Acts. He wants to bring that church back in greater splendor. Please, God is not after numbers. God is after accuracy. God is after righteousness. God is after justice. God wants to birth forth this remnant, if we can put it that way, people in the earth that will not cave in when things are got going right with their lives. Okay. Another thing is commitment to kingdom advance. Power of impartation through relationship. Penetration into the wisdom of God. Understanding human cooperation with God. That means divine partnerships, global joinings, multiple sons in covenant relationship with one another based on one apostolic fathering source, sold out to the eternal purpose, living from the eternal, viewing everything from the eternal and not to being time related. One of the things that God's going to burn up in the season is the holy place. You know, Moses had an outer court, a holy place and a most holy place. God is busy burning up the holy place. What do I mean by that? The holy place can be described as the place where we operate in reason, logic, and self-evaluation. It's the place where our minds are still too operative. I'm not talking about the mind of Christ, but I'm talking about the mind of Adam, the mind of the orphan, the mind of self-actualization, the mind of wanting my way and what I want for my ministry. Those things God is burning up and bringing us to the reality beyond the veil. The veil of our own flesh. The veil of our own carnality must be broken clear through so that the spiritual reality of who Christ is can begin to shine forth through our lives. It's no longer just me, my, and I but has got to do with the corporate reality of the living Christ. Okay, keep those thoughts in your mind. The power to break through in the spirit realm for territorial expansion. The ability to strip, listen to this, the ability to strip prophetic promises of their futuristic dimension and bring them into operation now. In other words, the prophetic is not going to operate as God saying that to happen 10 years from now, but apostolic ministry can go into the future of what the prophecy is saying and build it now so that we can live by it in the present. In that sense, prophetic ministry is changing. It is no longer just a personal prophecy, but it's building prophets, building alongside apostolic sources. So that the two works hand in glove, that we are bringing prophetic reality and the apostles build it dimensionally into the hearts and the minds of God's people. 
So we are using Apostle Paul's life to access apostolic patterns for living in times of crisis. As we willfully adopt these examples and patterns presented to us by apostolic figures, like Paul, we become the beneficiaries of apostolic wisdom forged in the crucible of personal suffering. Personal suffering. We have not seen much of God's power released simply because there's other people that want to submit fully and become fully compliant to what God is after. I believe the shift is coming. I don't know why God is always working with me first. This past four months was hell for me as I had to submit to dealings that I've never ever faced before in my life. But I believe that God wants to showcase what he is after in the earth. And so God wants to, to deal with the people, to bring a people to this reality that we need to embrace suffering, that we need to become people of mindset breakthrough, people that know how to press through even though there's resistance, people that know how to stand alone when the popular belief is going in one direction, you standing like Noah as the exception to the rule. You're not willing to compromise the holy standards of God. Even though the entire earth is against you, you stand alone like Jesus showed us. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. He opened on his mouth. He was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. There were no comeliness of beauty in him that we should desire him. And God laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He did not open his mouth. He did not squeal like a pig to the cross. He closed his mouth. He submitted under the authority of another and allowed the work of the Father to be completed in him on behalf of the people. That's what it means to be a bond slave. You're living your life for the benefit of another. You are not here to build your own ministry. You are not, if you are still building your own ministry, you are in the wrong place, sir. This has got nothing to do with my ministry and your ministry and my church and your church. You are going to go up against the one whose name is called Jealous. He's a jealous God. There's only one that possesses a church and his name is the Lord Jesus Christ. No man possesses a church. Yes, God has made us born slaves unto him for his people. We are not here to, to pull rank and file, but we are here to serve. The greatest joy for any person in the kingdom is to serve your master. To serve your master. It is an imperative to understand Paul's revelation of Christ. In Galatians 1, 15 to 16, we'll get to, Ephesians, to Philippians just now. Galatians 1, 15 to 16, listen carefully to this. Paul writes and he says, But when God who set me apart from birth and called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son in me, not to me, but in me, so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. You see, you can't preach him until he's revealed in you. There must be a revelation personally, personally to you of this Christ. Paul said, Paul had a crisis moment in his life when he was on his way to Damascus. It was there where Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? Saul, his name was Saul. And he asked, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And that day there was a crisis moment for Paul as Jesus revealed himself objectively to Paul. Paul had a revelation of this Jesus to him, not in him. I want you to understand this. Now, there are three dynamic processes for us to shift revelationally. Number one, some people only know Jesus historically. They only connect to Jesus of Nazareth that lived 2,000 years ago. That's out the court understanding of the person of Jesus. Then there are others that study him 
through doctrinal teaching, and that's not wrong. We need to. But it's objective reality that sometimes you get a secondary revelation that comes to you. But there is the presentation of Christ spiritually, subjectively, in your spirit. As you are intimately engaging Him, He reveals Himself to you. But that revelation is not absent of you being joined to an apostolic source. Very important. So many people, listen carefully, another shift that is coming is the following. That for too long, and, it's, and what we have done was good up until now, we have been reflecting on the earthly ministry of Jesus. We looked at his incarnation, which is right. We looked at his humiliation. We looked at his death, his burial, and his resurrection. But resurrection truths are transitional truths. Now God is saying, we got to begin to study this Jesus, not just in terms of his humiliation and the name of his humiliation, which is Jesus, but we need to now ship through, re through resurrection into enthronement truths. Listen carefully to me. Let me explain what I mean. If we are going to operate out from the throne of God, then we need to understand the current, ongoing, present function of the Christ. What is he doing currently? The same Jesus, Peter, on the day of Pentecost said, whom you crucified, God has made him both Lord and Christ. In other words, we cannot just share with people about his incarnation, his humiliation, and his crucifixion, and his death, and his burial, his burial and his resurrection anymore, but we also need to lift the people's gaze into the heavenly sphere of the ministry of Jesus Christ. We got to show them ascension truths. We got to show them enthronement truths. We got to show them coronation truths. We got to show them glorification truths and his sessionary work that he's doing currently in the heavens. That's another shift that is coming. So we need to take note of what God is saying to us. There is a shift coming, and this shift the Lord showed me. That not many, there are many that are earth dwellers. But not many are dwelling in the heavens. Whenever persecution comes, listen. Whenever difficulty comes, what we need most is a new revelation of the greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't need more of anything else, but we need to understand the universality, the supremacy, and the centrality of Christ. This is what Paul is doing in the Philippian epistle. He writes to them four chapters. He says in the first chapter, everything about what Paul is writing is Christ-centered. He writes in the first epistle, he says, for to me to live is Christ. In other words, he reveals in the first chapter Christ as his life. In the second chapter, he begins to talk about Christ being his goal. He says it like this. He says, for, he says that one thing I do, forgetting what is behind me, but straining myself to take a hold of that for which God has taken a hold of me in Christ Jesus, that I may gain the prize. My goal is to gain the prize. Even though I'm sitting in a dungeon, even though I'm sitting in, in a prison of Rome, but I want, um, I, my mindset is not earthly. I'm not connecting you Philippians to an earthly perspective of the Christ. I want you to see him as your goal. I want you to see him as your life. And then Paul begins to write and he says, Christ is my strength. He talks about Christ being his life, Christ being his goal, Christ being his strength. And when you study the whole epistle of the Ephesians, he consistently connects their minds to Christ. The Christocentricity that flows out of apostolic, an apostolic mind. 
This man is sitting waiting to be beheaded. He's sitting waiting for the end of his life. And he's still penning this epistle to a people that is encouraging. I have you in my heart. I love you with the affections of Christ. At every occasion when I think of you and bring you into my remembrance, I remember you in my prayers. I don't want you Philippians to pray for me. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I don't want you to sit wondering about my life. I know how to exist even in a physical prison, but I'm not in prison. Because in other epistles, in all the prison epistles, that the, the Ephesians, the Colossians, and Philemon, Paul writes and he says it like this, I bore the prisoner of Christ. In other words, I'm incarcerated in the physical chains of the Roman government, but I don't see myself as incarcerated by Rome. I am a bond slave to Christ. That's the shift that God is bringing. That we need to begin to see ourselves beyond our current expression of our lives in the earthly standards by which we live. And we need to lift our gaze into a different reality. And so this Paul, when he begins to, he begins to write and begins to talk about these things, he knew Christ in a spiritual way. He moved past the historical Christ, the Christ of history, Jesus the man from Nazareth. He moved past the theological and doctrinal Christ, knowing him through objective factual study. The spiritual revelation of Jesus Christ is inwardly by the Holy Spirit. In other words, in order for you to know Christ, the way that Paul wrote 20 years after becoming a Christian, Paul begins to pen down these words. He thought to me to love is Christ, that I may know Christ. Share in the fellowship of his sufferings. Be made conformable unto his death that I may somehow attain to his glorious resurrection. Paul says, for whom I have lost all things, I consider them done in the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have lost all things. And then Paul begins to write like this. I'm going very fast here. Paul begins to write like this. He says things like this. If there's somebody that has confidence in the flesh, me more. And then he gives his credentials. He's outlining, and I'm in another session, if I do get one, is to show you his credentials. How Paul outlines, circumcised on the eighth day. There were reasons why he was giving it like that. Circumcised on the eighth day. The eighth day was the commitment to keeping the Abrahamic covenant. In other words, God made a covenant with the forefathers that Paul said, I kept my mom and my dad took me on the eighth day and had me circumcised. Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day. So Paul was saying, there's nothing you can find within my makeup as a man that can, that can contradict who I am as a, as a believer that live as a Pharisee in the earth. I live from the strictest sect of the Pharisees. And I know what I'm saying. I have more confidence than any man. But all these things I count but dung for the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have lost all things. Paul uses the word consider. He says, I consider them rubbish. Consider is the word hegeomai, hegeomai, from which we get the ruler of his thoughts. In other words, the one that holds all strength, a hegemony, a hegemony, hegemony is the arrangement of authority where one holds all the power. And Paul is saying, I hedge your mind these things. I don't consider them. I, I allow the, the frontal block of my thoughts, the, the hegemon, the thing that govern my thoughts to be shifted out of the way. I will not allow my mind to be overtaken by my earthly way of thought. I count those things down, and I shift the new block of thought into my brain. Let this mind be also in you that was in Christ Jesus. 
I want all of you Philippians to hedge your mind, your old thoughts, your old ways, your old mannerisms, the way you think about yourself. I want you to cast aside the things that you think you are as a human and take on the things that Christ has so beautifully come and explained to us in the way of his incarnation. Seven steps down, and God took him to the highest place. What he is saying to us, that if he is the example, then we need to have the same mind. Let this mind be in you. And in other portions he says, be like-minded. The word like-minded is a very important word. It's the word phroneo in the Greek. It comes from another word, friend. The word friend means a picture is like a diaphragm. You know a guy that is in a coma in a hospital? He lays there and this machine is keeping him alive. The diaphragm is moving up and down. It breathes for him. It breathes for him. He's saying, be like-minded. In other words, let the mind of Christ be like a diaphragm that presses your mind into the eternal mindset so that you can breathe even though you are in a coma in your own brain. Because no longer has it got to do with just changing your mind. Repentance truth teach, taught us to change our minds. But changing the head geomai has got to do with the replacement of a mind. Now we're going deeper. We want the mind of Christ so that you are in a coma in your existence in the earth. Decapitated so that the mind of Christ can be screwed onto where your mind used to be. So that every thought that you think is no longer your thoughts, but is the thoughts of Christ only. Let this mind be in you. It was also in Christ Jesus. In other words, it's a directive from God. Paul is sitting in prison and he tells these Philippians, he says, even though you are suffering at the hands of the Romans, if continue with your testimony about the Lordship of Christ, continue to preach Christ, Him crucified, even though they are deifying the Caesars, even though they call Caesar Lord and they call him Savior, I want you to continue to say that he is our Lord. In fact, he's been given a name that is above every other name. Paul was actually very sarcastic when he wrote that. He was actually saying to them, hey, Ephesians or Philippians, I don't care what the Romans are calling the emperors. But we have an emperor that is above that emperor. His name is Jesus. And, his, and in his exaltation, the Father gave him a name that is above every other name, even the name Caesar. So I don't want you to be, to be pulling back. I'm in my bonds and my stocks. But it's been given unto you, Philippians, to find it a joy, not just to believe in Christ, but also to suffer for him. Huh? So we are maneuvering to the place. Suffering is not self-inflicted. Suffering comes because you're standing alone in your belief system. You have your hegemon changed. You have the mind of Christ. You are no longer just living here and there. You're living on one reality only. I am a slave, a bond slave to Christ. I no longer love. Christ lives in me. Amen. The life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. It's a different reality that God wants to press us into as a church of Jesus Christ. It's going to become very imperative for us as the true apostolic people that we need to screw off, as it were, our brains. And get decapitated. Like the book of Revelation says, they ask, how long? Oh Lord, how long? These ones that were under the altar, the souls under the altar were crying out, how long? And the answer came, until all your brothers, brothers that are like you, have lost their own heads. 
In other words, God wants us to lose our heads in this new phase of the apostolic. So that we can only operate as a doulos. One whose rights are now vested in another. They say that the doulos had his ear pierced. So that the ear can be only inclined unto the voice of the master. Incline thine ears unto my sayings. That's the mind of humility. Is the mind continually inclined unto the word of Almighty God. It's not a mind inclined unto your own sayings. You have your ear pierced. You are no longer free. You've been bonded to another. God bless you. Interesting. Wow. Are you ready, ready to lose your lives? One of the fundamentals of this residency 